we will talk today about two uh, interesting projects, and uh, yeah, I will start uh, with uh, a short introduction of uh, TH Köln itself. Yeah, so maybe you don't uh, don't know uh, TH Köln. So here are some facts. Yeah, we are the uh, largest university of applied sciences in Germany. Yeah, so we have. Uh, over uh, 25,000 students, uh, they have the possibility to uh, choose between 90 uh, courses of study, so they have a lot of uh, options. Uh. And yeah, that's a little bit difficult if you have so many uh, students, yeah, uh, and hence we have, uh, yeah, not one campus, but a lot of campuses. Yeah? And we are distributed uh, all over the city of Cologne. And even Cologne is not uh, large enough for us. We also have campuses in Gummersbach, which is 40 kilometers away, and also a campus in Leverkusen. So all in all, uh, we are quite distributed, and also we have uh, quite diverse backgrounds in our faculties. Yeah? And myself, I'm a professor for computer graphics at uh, Campus Do at Campus Dolz. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm working there at the Institute for Media and Imag Imaging Technology, and this is an engineering faculty where I am located. And the second part of the talk will be given by uh, Katerina, and she is uh, at the Cologne Game Lab in Mülheim. And yeah, that's a faculty for cultural sciences. Uh, I have here a little uh, overview of all of our faculties. We have uh, 11 different faculties, yeah, and uh, we are from two really diverse backgrounds, and that's quite interesting. So we can do a lot of uh, interdisciplinary works, yeah, where you have uh, scientists from uh, really uh, uh, strongly different backgrounds, and this is very uh, beneficial for our work. And we also run together a motion capture uh, center, yeah, where we can uh, create animations of, uh, uh, of people for games, for animated films, and also, and that's I think maybe uh, the most important today, uh, we uh, are able there to uh, immerse people in virtual reality, so we have a really large capture area of 10 by 7 meters, and there we can uh, have, uh, you can experience immersive virtual realities. Okay, but today, this won't be uh, the topic of my ta talk today, uh, today, I would like to, to uh, bring to you some uh, interesting techniques we have developed at our university for uh, improving 3D product visualization. Sorry about that. Um, should put it away. Um, so, you maybe, all of you, uh, know or have seen a lot of product visualizations in the last years. Uh, for instance, if you have bought a car recently uh, and you had some... Uh, uh, commercial material, uh, all the images you have seen uh, won't be real photos, but uh, it will be uh, renderings of, uh, of the cars. Yeah? And also, maybe uh, you recently bought some furniture, uh, uh, maybe at IKEA, yeah? and if you look at the IKEA catalog, yeah, more than half, a lot of more than half of the images are renderings yeah, and not photographs. So, 3D product visualization is a very important topic, and also it's getting more and more immersive. Yeah? In the recent years, uh, or no, recently, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for the web, there was uh, developed the technology of web VR, where it's possible to have just in a web shop a little button where you can instantly go into, into virtual reality, and then it would be possible to uh, uh, visualize product there. Yeah? You can uh, think of uh, virtual reality games where you have maybe product placements of virtual products, yeah? and maybe the most interesting part will be uh, augmented reality. Yeah? Apple just presented the uh, AR kit uh, for their uh, iPhones, yeah? where you can put the virtual product directly in your living room. So there are a lot of uh, possibilities, yeah? but still, there's a challenge. Okay, there are several challenges. Yeah, but today I would like to talk about one challenge. Yeah, uh, if you have, uh, if you want to uh, visualize uh, a product, uh, you often have the shape of the product available in a CAD file, for instance. Yeah, but uh, you don't have uh, any material description. Yeah. In the end, you uh, have also uh, to use a, a rendering engine. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, nowadays not a problem anymore. There are a lot of options for uh, high-quality renderers. Yeah. You can choose uh, just one of them. Yeah. But the question is, how can I get from the shape on the, 
on the left side yeah, to, the, uh, to the nice rendering on the right side. And therefore, an artist, a 3D artist, spends a lot of time uh, creating textures uh, uh, for the various uh, material surfaces you can see in, uh, in this image. Yeah? For this image, maybe it would take uh, several hours. If you have a more complex visualization or a more complex product, uh, it can even take days. And this is not, not really cost effective. Yeah? If you think of a web shop, uh, he, he wants to display all uh, of the uh, products uh, as, uh, as a virtual product. Yeah? It's just uh, uh, too, too expensive to do that. So we need a different technology. Yeah? And yeah, one idea maybe would be to capture just the color of the object. So what we have done here, we did a little experiment and we made a flatbed scan of a, uh, 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 of a material surface and then we rendered it. And this is the image on the, on the left. In the center, there's an image uh, rendered uh, with uh, textures we have acquired with a scanner we have developed at uh, our university. And on the right, you can see the photo of the surface. And I think, as you can see, uh, having only the color from the flatbed scanner is just uh, not enough. Yeah? This uh, looks uh, really not good. You, you don't see any surface details. You don't see any, um, any bumps on it. And also, most importantly, the reflections are just not right. And with our technology, uh, I think we are not perfect yet, but very close to the reality. And yeah, how did we do this? Um, three years ago, we started a, a national research project in uh, cooperation with a company, uh, with the Assist GmbH, and in this project, we had the objective to um, develop a, a rendering pipeline for virtual garments. And for this, we needed some scanning technology and also some real-time rendering, because real-time rendering of garments is uh, a little uh, bit more complicated than many other uh, uh, materials because of the transparency, inherent transparency in the different layers. But I also would like, not like to talk uh, about the, the renderer today uh, because we only have a little, not, not much time for it, yeah, but uh, the, uh, the scanning device. Yeah, and we had the vision to, to create a scanner which is able to uh, uh, capture the material appearance within, within just some minutes. Yeah, and also because of textile materials uh, can be repeated easily, we just said, okay, then we can capture uh, uh, material air for, by, by 10 by 10, 10 10 by 10 centimeters, this is enough. And so we came up with the idea to have such a box uh, where, you, where you can put in the material sample and uh, just after five minutes you get your scan data, which consists of a set of textures uh, which you can yeah, put into any rendering software, uh, uh, in the rendering software of your choice. Um, here are some project results. Uh, we uh, have made a, a close-up and also an overview rendering. And on the left, you can see that our technology is able to uh, recreate uh, the uh, interesting uh, surfa uh, variation in surface height uh, for, the, for the left uh, uh, fabric. And on the right, you, you can even see the fine details. I, I hope you can see it. Oh, yeah, I think it uh, uh, can be seen quite well on the beamer. Uh, so uh, we, we, we are able to, to uh, really capture the fine structure of all the yarns uh, of this uh, fine weaving of uh, the straw of this fabric. Okay, but this project was a little bit limited yet. Oh, here's it. And so we started, or we had a follow-up project that, uh, which started half a year ago. Yeah? Uh, it's also a nationally funded uh, project. And here's the objective was to uh, yeah, be able to scan more materials, yeah? not only fabrics, but uh, also metal, glass, and uh, stuff like this. And also, we have the vision to get a really large capture area of uh, one square meter. Yeah? And on the right, you can see in the image uh, the prototype of it. Uh, this is just the dome structure yeah? in uh, which the, the, the capture device will be uh, put into. And for scale, we just put a, a chair into it. So you see it's a really a, a big scanner, yeah? but uh, with this, we think that we can uh, achieve our uh, goals. And also, we did some improvements to the existing scanner. 
Uh, and so I can show you the first results of, uh, of this uh, current project. Uh, on the left, you see the, again the, the wooden uh, floor uh, tile in a, in a 3D scene. In the center, we have a, a nice uh, rendering of, uh, of a key, yeah, where you really see it's a one key, and, and you can see, really see, it's, uh, see the, the, uh, uh, the surface has uh, all, the, all the details a, a real key would have. Yeah. On the right, there's a nice product. It's, it's a notebook, book, and uh, you can all see the engravings and so on. And that's possible with our uh, current technology. And here's also a fabric example where we have a one-to-one -one comparison between, between the real uh, surface. On the left uh, uh, side, there's a photo. On the right side, we put this uh, uh, or the acquired textures on a, on a, on a 3D model of a pillow. Yeah? And I think uh, one ca you can really see so that's uh, quite similar from the structure, from the reflection behavior, and so on. Uh, the only problem here is we, we uh, did not recreate the exact same lighting conditions. So uh, uh, there are a little, uh, there, there are some differences between the, the images, but uh, the, the appearance, I think, uh, is okay and, and very similar. Yeah. And finally, I would like to say we are very happy uh, this research project is funded yeah, by the Europe European Union and uh, the state of North Rhine-Westphalia as well. So uh, uh, we are really very grateful for our uh, funder, uh, funders. Yeah. Okay, and now I think the most important part, yeah, you will have the chance to uh, experience uh, the things I have uh, talked today, because we have brought, uh, uh, and uh, we can show you here at the fair, a, 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 a live demo, a virtual reality demo, where you can look at these materials and the, and the virtual products we have sh uh, I have shown and uh, talked about. So just feel free to come to our booth, it's B25, and try out, and uh, it's really uh, fun playing with it. You can uh, take uh, your hands, you can move the lamp, you can move the material, and then you can uh, have a look at the fine surface structures uh, and the change of reflection and so on, and the uh, quality of, uh, our, of our scanning technology. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, now, uh, Katerina will yes. uh, take over, and at the end of the talk, I think uh, there will be some room for questions. Thank you, Arnulf. So, uh, maybe we can transition to my presentation here. Um, so Arnov already mentioned that we come from kind of two different worlds, but uh, in the end it's very exciting to have projects together. You will also have the opportunity to see one of these projects downstairs today, because uh, one of our former students um, has a really nice project that opens a Kickstarter campaign today, which ex uses exactly that technology that you are uh, uh, providing and, and um, uh, researching at your institute. I'm switching to a slightly different topic. My topic is augmented reality gaming today. And uh, yeah, ah, there it is. Um, and uh, uh, the project that I'm presenting is a game project that comes from two different funded projects that play with the idea um, of augmented reality and location-based and learning. One project, which was called His2Go, um, which ended last month, um, uh, was really dedicated to the learning effect and bringing uh, uh, something new and exciting to the city of Cologne. It was funded by the Rheinenergie Stiftung, and we are tra transitioning this game prototype now to the next step with a project which is called EPSA, which is funded with regional and European funds. So, talking about Porta Pretoria today, it's a location-based game that really enables you and your friends, it's a multiplayer game, to explore the Roman Cologne on site. This is why, unfortunately, we couldn't bring it to the trade fair, because the trade fair is not really associated with Roman infrastructure here. Um, we brought a different project, I will mention that later, but I would like to introduce you to the project. It's in an early uh, prototype stage, as I already mentioned, and um, the game really focuses on the location-based technologies and bringing this together with AR. So we want to teleport our players into the Roman times and um, also, another approach was really to provide a new angle specifically for students at the age of 12, 13, who come to Cologne on a regular basis to int get introduced into the topic of Roman culture. And uh, most of them visit the Roman 
museum here in Cologne. The Roman Museum is really artifact-based. There are a lot of different uh, old artifacts, uh, but the storytelling is usually, um, is usually taken on by the guides that you have within the museum. And we wanted to go one step further and bring the outside of the city of Cologne into the game and provide an experience that will eventually lead the players from outside later into the museum. And this is the first step. So what we did was uh, to create a scenario or uh, a game story where you as players really get sucked into the ancient Cologne and we are currently focusing on the first century. Um, and this is how we do it. Hallo. Hallo. Is there anyone? My name is Julia Kaiser. I'm in the Vergangenheit. Ich hoffe, meine Nachricht erreicht irgendjemanden. Ich habe keine Ahnung, was passiert ist. Ich sehe auch ganz anders aus. Ich weiß nur eins, ich habe nicht viel Zeit, bis ich hier auffange. Wenn ihr das hört, kommt zum Nordtor. Bitte helft mir und beantwortet. So we have a little introduction story where our protagonist uh, uh, calls for help and uh, we will start with teams of three in the Roman Cologne. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's tailored for cla entire classes, sets of 30 uh, people or uh, if you just want to play it um, uh, with a couple of friends. Um, the game server will automatically distribute uh, IDs and will team up each three people with, a, with their own device and bring them into the system. We did a little early testing with a few kits um, throughout the past weeks. And um, you can see, so they get this intro film and then automatically they get a map on their phones and they try to find the Nortor, so the northern gate of the city and uh, uh, get a few hints that they can, in a Pokemon Go-like way, find augmented reality markers in the space that will unravel their missions. So, um, what happens next, and this is the multiplayer approach in all of this, um, is that uh, once they arrive at the gate, suddenly they also get sucked into the time tunnel and uh, uh, each of the three players moves to a different time period and they have different information on their phones. And this is our learning approach, which is really exciting and has been a theory until two weeks ago and we are uh, over the moon that, um, that the concept of having different information on three devices really brings the players together not to only check their phones but really to compare the content to discuss what kind of content might lead to the next clue that could give them information where to go next and what to explore next. So, um, as you see here, we had different groups of players who tested the entire thing. And uh, it's really interesting, the dynamic that comes up when you, when you use this kind of content, augmented reality content, and have kids, particularly kids, interact with each other. They will not stay to their own phones, but they will also share their content and, um, and try to gather information from, from their other players what to do. So at this moment you can see a scene where they are um, trying to find um, a place where they can dig into the earth at the Altamarkt. And um, so we've hidden um, old vases beneath the ground of the Altamarkt virtually, of course, and uh, they were set to explore this and collect these vase fragments. This is a, a rendered scene, but it's actually how it looks like in the game. We just didn't have the right filter. So once they arrive at a specific place, uh, we use visualization technique, augmented reality techniques, and you can already see um, the problems with positioning augmented reality content on such a large scale here. Um, we are positioning this content and there are also characters coming in and interacting with the players. They address the players and then in, uh, you can select different content and move on in your game story. So here's another scene from, from last week's test discovering markers and also um, 
really finding elements in the augmented reality perspective. So, um, this talk is at least since we only have a few minutes to share a few insights into our um, challenges and also our hopes that what we can achieve with um, playing with augmented reality in an educational setting. Educational setting for us in this regard of this game means it's explorative. We don't want to push information on the kids. It's really to give them a light introduction to how the Roman Cologne looks in large scale. So they are standing at a specific point and then they can tilt their phones and really discover how big these buildings were. On the one hand, we have these originally textured buildings, which we might use your textures in the future for, uh, because it's a hell lot of work to do everything by hand. Um, so we are, we are using rendered content of the architecture, but then it was really important for the pedagogues that we worked with to not have everything set in stone, which means uh, we don't know how the Roman Cologne looked like in every corner. We only have a few hints and, of course, um, researchers have put their mind together how the Roman Cologne might have looked like. So to achieve this ambiguity between, okay, this is what we think we know and this is what we really know, um, we go for the approach of, yes, using completely textured surfaces, but then breaking them down into this polygonesque aesthetic that the kids really can wander through. So it's just a trigger for the kids to help them, okay, this is probably what it looked like, but then we let fantasy take over again and don't pretend as if we would really know how everything would have looked like in detail. What you see um, here, so we are using augmented reality in every angle that is possible. And that's a, quite a challenge, specifically if you design for uh, a broad target group. So we were tackling kids age 12, 13 in the beginning, but we can already see uh, that the entire project already appeals to a, a very broad uh, amount of people. And this is where it's getting tricky because you have always have the positioning problem, not only the positioning of the augmented reality content, so of the pre-rendered objects, and it's, we are using pre-rendered, so it's not virtual reality in room scale sense that you can really walk through a point, you arrive at a certain location and then you can do a 360 degree uh, turn around to explore things because positioning is still too wobbly to really uh, make, make it possible to walk through the entire city. But that's the next step. So, Looking into all different angles is, is a big problem because, first of all, how do you guide people to look into these different directions and how do you guide people of looking to the ground? And uh, specifically with our ground simulation here, um, where, um, where the players are supposed to uh, take out stones and dig in the earth with their device and then uncover fragments of the vases. Um, it's a problem to really map it to the floor. It really depends on the height of the player where the, uh, where the um, 3D object will be positioned on the ground. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is, um, we've, we've been starting to work on the conceptual idea um, of this in 2009 already when there was no augmented reality that could run on a device like this. Uh, and we are constantly moving on with the technology of what we can really achieve and how performative the devices are to really make our dreams happen in this regard, what we want to achieve in the, the end. And um, yeah, with this particular project, we have two more years to go and our plan is uh, to really, aside from the vertical slides that we already have, to move on and make the entire thing even more immersive than it already is. The question for kids, it's already super immersive. They don't need this totally immersiveness of the technology. They don't bother if something is a little bit delayed or something like this. We really found out that when they started playing the game and the game obviously introduced them very well to their own story world, they completely dived into 
the whole scenario and they were sucked up and didn't have any questions. We expected that we would have to interrupt the game, but it wasn't the case at all. And um, yeah, that, which brings me to the big question, do we need this complete fulfillment or is reduction and just giving a little clues, not possibly enough really to trigger a bigger fantasy that is not in the device, but in the people's minds. Thank you very much.